Are we rolling? <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I, I'm Dr. McVeigh. My first name is Jan. I'm, I'm the oversight position for Central Region, and I've been asked to do an approach for you guys to the patient in respiratory distress. So, just a general approach to the physical exam. So, I'm going to pretend that I'm a paramedic who, who's been called to a home for a, uh, a Mr. Neal who's not feeling well. So I'm going to arrive at the scene as one would, and the first thing that you're going to do is just take in the general general appearance of the patient. And Ms. Mr. Neal, I, I'm Dr. McVeigh. My first name's Jen. Nice, nice to meet you. You're not feeling very well. No. You're short of breath. Oh, okay. horribly. Okay. So in terms of the general appearance, I, I want to know, is he, is he lying flush? Is he sitting up? Does he seem to be working hard to breathe? Is he, is he unconscious or not? Um, so just in terms of, of general appearance, what, what does he look like? And then, and then you try to engage him in conversation, and the reaction you get to that is, is going to help you understand how distressed he is as well. So can he speak in full sentences to give you information, or is he only able to get one or two word sentences? Or can he not even talk at all because he's working too hard? So, so when did you start feeling unwell? Uh, earlier today. Okay. Just came on. I was piling wood. And okay. It happens sometimes. Okay. Take puffers. All right. Any pain with this shortness of breath? No. Okay. No. Do you have any medical history? Uh, COPD. Okay. Or something. That's what I think they call it. Okay. All right. And no other medical problems? A uh, bad back, but other than that, it's all okay. right. And do you take any medications? Uh, just prescribed. Okay. All right. Uh, any allergies to medications? Clavulin. Okay. So, it, so when you're getting your information on your on your history of the presenting illness and the past medical history, if he can actually tell you that amount of information, it tells you that he's at least not so distressed that he can't talk. So at least know that he can he can speak. So while I'd be doing doing a little bit of history, I'd have my partner get ready to to uh, get the vital signs done. And the really important ones for this guy here are going to be the O2 sat, the respiratory rate. Um, and his, uh, his heart rate, and then of course a full set, set of vitals are always important. So I definitely want to know his O2 sat and his respiratory rate. If his O2 sat is less than about 90, then I'm getting more so concerned, and you're going to start doing some interventions while you're doing your assessment as well, giving him oxygen and this sort of thing. And then in general, if his, if his respiratory rate is less than 8, then you're starting to worry that he's not breathing enough, and that sometimes suggests more of a hypercapnic respiratory failure. If his rest rate is too high, so he's working too hard, 30, 30 or more, then that typically goes along more so with a hypoxic respiratory failure. So he, he's working quite quite hard to breathe. We'll say we do his SATs and they're in the low low um, 80s, so we'll put some oxygen on him and try to get him up to at least 90. And then I continue on with my exam. So we always do ABCs, right? So, so even in the patient with respiratory distress, is there something wrong with his airway? So is there any swelling? Is there any signs of obstruction? Have you had a sore throat or? No. Okay. Horse. So, horse. Okay. And we look at the neck for any signs of swelling or anything that may be impairing his breathing in the, in the upper airway. We want to check and see if his trachea is midline for, for any suggestion of a, a pneumothorax. And then while you're here, if you're worried about congestive heart failure, take a look at the JVP as well. So you want to make sure the JVP isn't elevated. It shouldn't really be more than about four finger breaths from the from the external notch there. So you, you have a look there while, while you're in the neighborhood. Then then I get the patient to lean forward and we're going to auscultate the chest in the back. So depending on your pre-hospital scene, you want to expose the patient as best you can. So I listen at the bases first, and then I move up just kind of like this on either side around the, around the scapula. At this point, we're going to auscultate the chest. I always start listening at the bases because I think that's where the most information is, and then I just kind of make a J and, and a backwards J coming up around the, the scapula in the back. So, sir, can you just take some deep breaths for me in and out through your mouth? Okay, 
And so I'm listening for, is there air entry bilaterally or is there decreased air entry? I'm listening for crackles or wheezes or any other adventitious sounds. If you're, if you're going to be very thorough, then you can listen in the front as well. So, sir, I'll get you just to lie back there for a second. And what I'll do is just listen just at the, the tops of both his lungs bilaterally. So you have a deep breath in. Good. And again. Good. So at that point, I, I, I find it, I move to the leg. So if you're worried about congestive heart failure or worried about possibly a PE, it's worth always looking at the, the calves and the, the ankles for any swelling. And then I just ask the patient if there's been any increased swelling recently as well. So I have a feel of their calves and see if there's any calf tenderness or pain to suggest a DVT. And I look for swelling, any kind of pitting edema when I push on the ankles. And also, if, if there is edema, is it unilateral or, or bilateral? If it's unilateral, you start to worry more so about a DVT and a PE. So there, there's other things that you can do as part of the respiratory exam, like tactile, frematis, egophony, um, other, other ways to listen to the chest, but I don't think it's all that useful for us in the pre-hospital or, or, frankly, in the emergency department. So, so at this point, that's a, that's a quick assessment. That's what I would recommend you do. I wouldn't go on doing other fancier tests because I don't think it's going to make a difference to what, what you do with the patient. So at this point, I'd start working on your differential and, and doing your interventions as you go along, depending on what you think is the cause. And I think that's probably everything. Okay, so, uh, so that's a wrap. Uh, if you have any questions, call me. <laughs> I'll be more happy to help. Thank you, Neil, for being our... Uh, Patient, I hope you feel better soon. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.